Hi, everyone. My name is John Blitzchok, and I'm a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Chicago. And I'm excited to tell you uh, today about uh, my package, Workflow R. So my background is in academic science. Um, during my dissertation research in human genetics, I spent most of my time writing code to analyze genetics data, but I never received any formal training in computing. And so I spent a lot of time uh, struggling with common computational challenges, like how to organize files, especially as a project grew from an initial idea to a full-fledged project. How to track intermediate results, as I was constantly exploring the data and collecting new data to add to my data set. Things were always changing, and it was hard to know which version of result was created from which version of the code. And lastly, sharing results uh, efficiently. How can I get the latest results to my advisor and colleagues without having to constantly send email updates? And so these challenges were my motivation for developing the Workflow R package, which depends on three key technologies. Literate programming with NIDR and R Markdown, version control with Git, and then free web hosting uh, provided by GitHub. So the foundation of Workflow R is the popular literate programming framework, likely familiar to most of you, uh, from, from NIDR and R Markdown. So this allows you to intermix your documentation and code in the source file, and then generate a nice report, which is critical for reproducibility, having the code that generated the results right next to it. So there's no amb ambiguity of what decisions were made to create those results. And you don't have to just have independent, uh, isolated analyses. Our Markdown has the ability to make websites of interconnected files. Um, by including an underscore site.yaml file in the directory, you can have a navigation bar and shared uh, aesthetics across your website without writing any uh, HTML yourself. And this is an example of what that would look like. The second key technology is version control with Git. Uh, so what Git does is it tracks the development of your code. It'll assign a unique ID to each snapshot, along with an accompanying message that you write describing what you were doing when you saved the, saved the version of the code. And so by tracking your code like this, then you can know when you have a result, which exact version of the code uh, produced that result. Uh, but the downside of Git, uh, as many of you may have found out, I certainly found out when I was learning, is that the steep learning curve prevents you from gaining a lot of the benefits quickly. And so what Workflow R does is it uses the Git to R package to automate all the, the most common Git commands so that you can focus on your analysis and get the benefits of Git without first having to spend uh, a lot of time trying to get comfortable with it. And so while you don't need to understand Git syntax to get started with Workflow R, knowing some of the basic terms is helpful uh, to understand what it's trying to do. So a Git repository refers to all the files that are being tracked by Git, along with their revision history. And when I say a snapshot or a version of the code, and if you're reading a, any D Git documentation, that's referred to as a commit. And so lastly, once you've created this version controlled website, uh, our Markdown website, you'll want to be able to share that as easily as possible. And not everyone has access to a web server or wants to learn about web hosting uh, technology. And so GitHub uh, has a nice free service called GitHub Pages. And it allows you for each repository of code you have, so each individual project, it will host a website uh, for free. So then you can have a dedicated website associated with each one of your individual projects. And this can be done with just uh, clicking a few uh, settings, um, which is much easier than setting up your own web server. And so the end product uh, of the Workflow R framework is a version controlled research website. And over the past, uh, past year, researchers from around the world have been using Workflow R to make their research more organized, reproducible, and shareable. And so next, I'll share with you how Workflow R implements uh, uh, these features. So first, organization. So when it's time time to start a new project, if you're using Workflow R, you can pass the name of the new directory to the function Workflow Start. So this does multiple things. It populates this new directory with the, to all the template files you need to get started. It changes the working directory to that new directory. It'll initialize a new Git repository and make the initial commit of all these files. And for our studio users, there's also available um, from the new, uh, new project menu directly from the IDE. And so this creates the following organized directory structure with subdirectories to help you keep your analysis from growing to a bunch of files just in the root of the project. 
For example, there's subdirectors for data and code. Um, however, most of these are optional. The required ones for the workflow R framework are the analysis subdirectory. This is where all the R markdown files live, as well as that configuration file I had told you about, the underscore site.yaml, which will control the navigation bar and other website uh, aesthetics. And when you generate the website, they all get stored in the docs subdirectory. So this is where all the HTML, figures, and other supporting uh, website files go. And so Workflow R implements multiple uh, reproducible features, reproducibility features. So first, it's, it's really important when you run your code to run this in a clean environment. So any variables that are defined in your current R session or packages loaded could impact your results in unexpected ways. Um, and so it's important when you're running R code, especially when you have to produce the final results, to always restart your R session or clear your workspace. Uh, but it's easy to forget to do this. Um, and Workflow R makes it so it doesn't matter if you remember or not, because it doesn't actually run the code in your current workspace. When you run Workflow Build and pass it names of R markdown files to, to build, it uses the R package call R to actually run that code, each one in its own independent R process. And this has the added benefit is it prevents the R markdown files from interfering with each other with as well. If one loads a library that has conflict with another one, um, they're never going to intermix. Okay, and then the key is integrating Git to be able to track intermediate results um, as, you're, as you're generating your, uh, as your the project uh, goes along. And so the function is there is workflow publish, and it's going to perform three steps when you pass an R markdown file. It's going to commit the R markdown file to the source, uh, to the Git repository. It's going to rebuild and rerun all the code in that R markdown file to remake the, R, the HTML. And then it's going to commit in a subsequent commit the HTML and figure files that were created from it. And so this multi-step process is critical for the workflow R framework. Because by always doing it in two steps, committing first the R markdown, rebuilding, and then um, committing the HTML, and doing this in an in a iterative process as you make changes to your project, then you'll always know if you're looking at a result, one of these intermediate results, you'll know the exact version of the source code that generated those results. So you could come back months later, see the uh, uh, intermediate result, and know uh, how to get back to it. And so Workflow R exploits this uh, three-step process to make it easier for you and your uh, collaborators to see past results. So it inserts links to all past versions of the R markdown file um, that ever existed in the Git repository, as well as, you can see here, rendered versions of the past HTML. Um, and even each figure file within the analysis will have a drop-down menu where you can click on any of the past versions and immediately see that version um, on GitHub. And what's nice about this is that you don't have, no one, if you have one of your collaborators is reading this, they don't have to know anything about Git, they don't have to download anything. This is just a web browser that they can, you can send them a link and they can see both the current uh, and past results. And so the way Workflow R inserts all those links to the past uh, versions is using a custom output format, uh, Workflow HTML. And this extends the standard HTML document, if you're familiar with from the R Markdown package. And it does have a couple other features as well. It will record and insert the session information at the end of every analysis automatically. This way, whenever you go back and look at results, you know the exact operating system, R version, and package versions that generated those results. It also sets a seed prior to running the code in each analysis, so that if any of your results uh, rely on a uh, random process, that the, the results will still be reproducible when someone else runs them. And so to communicate all the reproducibility features that are going into this, uh, uh, the generation of this website, Workflow R inserts a reproducibility report at the top of each of the, of the pages. And so each one is a quick line. If it passes, it has a blue check mark and a quick little blurb about what it means. And if you click on any one of those um, bullet points, it will give a more detailed description. So this way, if someone else comes to your research website, they can see all the lengths that you've gone to make sure this is reproducible. And then similarly, if, if you see a, a red X, this is a warning that something went wrong. Maybe there was, uh, um, the seed wasn't set or your R markdown file wasn't committed. This would, in, this would, uh, be, this would um, insinuate that possibly that, that uh, you don't know the source code that, that created this, this document. And if you click on any one of these, it'll tell you what happened and how to fix it. 
Okay, lastly, Workflow R provides instructions to uh, deploy your website to make it shareable. So if you don't have access to a web, to a web server, uh, the easiest way is to follow a few steps on GitHub. So you create a new GitHub repository. Then back in your R session, you run the function workflow git push, which is a wrapper for the git push command. And this will send all your code up to GitHub and your website. And lastly, you go into the settings of, of, your, uh, of your new GitHub repository and tell it to activate GitHub pages to serve from the, all those HTML from that doc subdirectory. And then in the future, anytime you push new changes um, uh, to your GitHub repository, the website is instantly updated. So anyone who goes to it is going to see the latest results. All right, to, get to try out Workflow R, if you're interested, so in addition to R, you'll need the document converter Pandoc, uh, which you can easily install if you've already installed R Studio. It comes shipped with it. Uh, and note that installing Git is optional. This is because the Git2R package comes bundled with libgit2, a uh, pure C implementation of Git. So you don't even have to worry about trying to install Git on your computer to test this out. You can install Workflow R from CRAN. Um, and we have lots of uh, unit tests and continuation, continuous integration set up to try and make sure that Workflow R works well on all three major operating systems. So if you do experience any issues, please do open an issue on GitHub so we can uh, fix it as quickly as possible. But we've done our best to make sure that, that there shouldn't be issues. And lastly, if you're going to use GitHub to, um, to serve the website, uh, you'll need to use GitHub, but you can serve it however you want. If you don't want to use GitHub and you have access to, say, your university provides you uh, a personal web page, the website can be so hosted from there as well. And lastly, we have a package down generated uh, documentation website where we have vignettes on how to get started and how to further customize your website. So in summary, using Workflow R allows you to start working reproducible, more reproducibly with Git without having to first learn how, how to use Git syntax or even how, trying to install it. It allows you to focus on your analysis without trying to remember to set a seed or restart your R session and these other reproducibility safeguards. All this is done automatically for you. If you use the Workflow R functions, you can't, be, uh, you can't break these, uh, these checks. And lastly, it allows you to share your results online in real time as you update them, both with your colleagues and the wider community. So I'd like to thank my co-authors, Peter Carbonetto and Matthew Stevens, uh, early adopters for testing and feedback, authors and contributors to the key R packages uh, I depend on, Knit R, R Markdown, Git2R, and Call R, uh, and the Moore Foundation for funding. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my work. Thanks for your attention. I take any questions. Great question. So, so Peter's question is about what if you have large files um, that may be changing? So um, yes, I face this problem. I'm doing next generation sequencing data, so I can't commit these gigabyte size files into GitHub. So um, obviously this framework works better if the, not only the code is versioned, but the data. So I have two strategies for dealing with that. So one on smaller projects, I try and I, I consider workflow R starting when you're doing exploratory data analysis. So these are files you should be able to read into R fairly easily. So in the example of next generation sequencing, once I have like an expression matrix that's you know 25 megabytes, that's what I start committing to Git. And so then the, both the data that I'm analyzing and the code are versioned, which makes this more powerful. Um, in a recent project where the data is too big, it's single cell RNA sequencing. I'm using Git LFS, um, which is a way to commit. Um, commit sort of tags of the, of, the, of the files, and then they just get uploaded to a server. Um, so it makes it more manageable. Um, that's obviously a lot more um, involved uh, to set that up. But I'd be happy to, if anyone has challenging data, I'm happy to talk afterwards, too, about practical ways to make that happen. Good question. Yep. Okay, great question. Uh, so the question is, how do you uh, use this if you want to share it with your collaborators, uh, but not yet the general public? Um, that's probably the most common question I get. So the problem is that GitHub Pages is always public. So even if you make the Git repository itself private, so people can't go and see the source code, technically that website is discoverable. Um, 
Now, if it's just a personal preference, you don't want people to see it, um, most likely no one will ever find it, especially if you make the GitHub repository private. Um, I've tested this. If you put in really specific things, search terms, it's really you're still on like the third or fourth page of Google. So, um, but if you have like HIPAA data or something that is very sensitive, you would need to set up your own web server that had um, access. Um, and that's just beyond the ability of me to write documentation since there's, that could be a whole book of, of setting up a secure uh, website. Yes. Does it work with uh, GitHub Enterprise? Does it work with GitHub Enterprise? Um, I don't know, uh, but I can't imagine it wouldn't. Uh, GitHub Pages is free, so I assume they wouldn't take away free features from you, if any. Oh, I see it's a different URL. I see. Oh, I see, because you set it up on your own servers. I see. Um, right now, then, no. You, well, parts of it would work, but those automatic leaks to GitHub were going to work. Um, you'd have to set in the configuration file. Basically, yes. In the configuration file, I allow you to specify your own URL to GitHub. Say if you, were, if you had a fork and you didn't want your fork to get inserted into there, you want the main one, you just change it. So yes, if you had a different URL, if we, as long as you set that in the configuration file, which is a, uh, I didn't talk about today because that's sort of in the weeds. Um, yes, I think that could probably work. Um, and I'd be happy to test it out. Feel free to open an issue if, if you have any trouble with it. Yes. Is there a way to integrate this to things like blog down? Um, you'll be able to, to um, they're all based on our markdown, so you find fluid to try them all out. So this is really optimized for a research project where you're constantly changing things um, and you want to like, so the reason I was doing it is because yeah, you, you present in lab meetings, you make posters, you do all this stuff, and then two years later, it's like, where did all these figures come from, right? Whereas a blog post is sort of an ephemeral thing. So if you want to make a blog, I would just use blog down. And same thing with a book. If you want to write a book, book down is probably what you want. There's no need to keep every single version of the book you ever made. The end product is really what you want. Um, but with research, when you're constantly changing the data and you may never be able to figure out how you made that plot again, this makes sure that it's always uh, recoverable. A question? Yes. Right, so this is definitely aimed for the more um, simple cases. So there's no, um, there's no um, dependency structure between the files. Like if you wanted the files to run in a certain order, you'd have to name them al alphanumerically to make them do that. This isn't trying, so if you want something like Drake and R or Snakemake and Python, those are for more complex things and I use those for those parts of my projects. This is really the exploration phase when you're trying statistical models, visualization, and just keeping that all um, version controlled and easy to share. For example, I don't want to keep having to email my advisor back and forth. I just want to be able to update my website and he can follow the same URL. Um, but anyway, so my, my advisor, Matthew Stevens right now, the reason he's interested in me developing this is because he gets new master students all the time who know how to use R, but their projects are kind of a mess and if he goes and tries to work on them. So this way, all his students have an organized directory structure. They all have these websites. He can see exactly what they ran. It's all versioned. Um, and these are new statistics students. They, they, know, they know R, they're very talented in statistics, but they haven't had the time to develop um, some of these other more software engineering skills. And the thing is that this just handles it and explains what it's doing so you can learn it. So in the future, you could either continue using this or try and do it yourself. Thanks for the question. All right, thank you so much.